What's up everybody? Welcome to Test Fix. Today we talk about bots again because we have big, big news from Boston Dynamics as well as from Figure. They're doing a great job developing new bots. Strong competition to Tesla again. The Tesla bot, we've seen a lot of improvements there with the teleoperation, but uh, we know Boston Dynamics is on the block a little bit longer. We're going to look into this with a very important person to look into this. You might guess already who that's going to be. Welcome to Tesla Fix. Make sure to subscribe and like this episode. Scott Walter is here back again, because when we talk about bots, of course, we have to have you on, Scott. So, yeah, <laughs> say hi to yeah, the audience. I guess it was me, too. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <was> <laughs> some people are wondering, are you a bot? Uh, who knows? I mean, you, you work really? so long with, with bots and robotics, uh, and it's super interesting what we've, we've seen mm -hmm. in the last couple of days. And of course, Tesla is always surrounded by all this buzz and layoffs now, and uh, we have so much uh, news around that. But I think the robotic segment is super interesting to, to dive into as well. A new kit on the block also arrived again, kind of Boston Dynamics already released many, many bots, but how do you see the developments there? Okay. Yeah. And your, your reference to new kids on the block is, is a member that was a, I think a nineties band that came out of Boston. <laughs> and so it was appropriate that Boston Dynamics would sort of come up with a new kid on the block. And this is a redesign of the original Atlas bot, which was a hydraulically driven bot, but you know, one of the the first sort of bipedal bots that was used in R and D projects around the world, um, you know, definitely the DARPA challenge and others and Boston dynamics never really meant it to be something other than a development platform. Uh, it wasn't going to be commercialized. They mentioned that many times. So sort of said they're almost like their own uh, best critic when it came to, um, whether, uh, the, te whether, op whether Atlas was really a competitor to Optimus and the others, because it wasn't really designed for that use case. And uh, I guess it kind of surprised us the other day when they announced the retirement. I mean, everyone was expecting that they were probably going to announce the retirement, but did that mean they were out of the bot space completely or were they going to come back in? And sure enough, the yeah. next day we get that. So this is the retirement announcement. Atlas was very famous for being able to do parkour and other very athletic kind of things. Remember, it was meant to be more in the search and rescue kind of activities. It doesn't have a yeah. very long battery life. It has hydraulic actuators to give it the power that you need to do these kind of, uh, of actions. But it wasn't really something that was designed to work in the factory or, or work in the home. So it wasn't really clear what they'd be able to do with it. Now, Boston Dynamics does have experience with electric actuators because they have their spot dog, which is all electric. Um, they've developed a couple other bots as well for the more like industrial bots that are also electrically actuated. So it's not a surprise that they'd be able to figure that out to be able to go from this kind of hydraulically actuated to an all electric. And that's exactly what they did. And I guess half of the people were thinking they were out of the business. And of course, there you can see the hydraulics. You, you see a lot of blowouts there. In, like I like to say like an ACL tear or something else right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, very common athletic injuries. We all know about uh, what, what's like with a knee, but you know, it was very impressive, but you see very, very heavy, uh, didn't have fully formed hands, so it really couldn't do much more than pick up some simple boxes and move it around. And again, I don't know that you need to do things like that on the factory floor. You know, mm -hmm. it's like these yeah, kind of, of it's it's something else that you you really need to have there. Um, and so they remember they're owned by Hyundai, which is an automotive manufacturer. Mm -hmm. And the question is, what is Hyundai getting out of the relationship? So it was time for them to come up with something that might actually be a practical use because. All the automotive companies are really thinking about humanoid bots in their factories. So it's not just Tesla, but you know, BMW has moved in that direction. Mercedes has moved in that direction. We're pretty sure the others are kind of looking at it or have some sort of curiosity. Hyundai owns a company that makes these things. So it would only make sense that you'd have to come up with a form factor to do it. And sure enough, they then announced um, the day after on Wednesday, the new Atlas bot. Uh, which is all electric. And let's say they had a really quite the sensational opening. So there it is. Atlas is kind of like down <laughs> for the count and decides to come back up. And of course it comes, decides Jesus to come back Christ. up and a rather unnatural kind of posture there. Uh, and as we can see, it has a very huge range of motion. It's able to have kind of like an owl's head. Some people say it reminds them of the Pixar lamp. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, certainly is a unique design that it's not double jointed. So the knee is not double jointed and the elbows are not double jointed, but because they're able to do a lot of rotation in the shoulder and also in around the hip 
they can quickly mm -hmm. reverse direction. And actually, we've criticized this for a lot of the other humanoid bots out there. They're very slow to pivot and change mm -hmm. direction. They take forever mm -hmm. to be able to do it. Ah, so this mm -hmm. could be potentially a huge advantage to be able to change direction because you can not only uh, change direction, but start moving towards your target at the same time. Already, really, yeah, already really while moving. Mm -hmm. Oh, and when, when you compare it to the other bots, it is a huge uh, time saver right there. The question is like, is this too creepy for some people? And of course, when you look mm -hmm. at it at first, there's that shock value. And they intentionally put that shock value in there. They mm -hmm. uh, Robert Plater even mentioned it in an interview he did the other day, I think with IEEE Spectrum, yeah. that you know they were thinking about that because there's more than one way to get up off the floor. And so they go around and they, they bend it to be able to show that capability. And you know that I don't know any contortionist that can do that. I mean, you well, need extreme impressive. flexibility. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, and and the contortionist definitely can't do that with their head, and they definitely can't then do that with their body. But then again, I could be wrong. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. uh, so at least let's say as, as normal people can't do something like that. Um, mm -hmm. And now there's there's some there's a lot of questions um, th that we have that we don't have full answers to yet. So we don't have the the um, the tech specs for this. So one thing is I'm not sure how tall it is and I'm not sure mm -hmm. how much it weighs. My first impression is like, oh, it, it's probably like 50th percentile kind of height. And that's, um, but some people feel it's pretty short um, and not as tall as some of the other bots, which um, it would be kind of surprising that if you want something that's going to work in these ergonomic workspaces, you don't want it to be too small. I mean, if, if it is short, it's like at the lower level of where you would want it to be. And I'm not quite sure how heavy it is. So I've actually run a poll on X to ask people to guess. Cause you know, they say sometimes when the crowd guesses like how many uh, beans are in the jelly bar, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, the yeah, jelly, yeah. you know, that, that, in that those that's a crowdsource, uh, yeah. they get it right, you know, on, on the average. <laughs> so I'm hoping, well, maybe, maybe the same thing here is that we'll get kind of an idea. Um, but someone mentioned that they, is the original uh, Atlas is four foot 11, which, um, I, I'm not quite sure what that is in, in, in metric. Um, most of the bots are over the five foot level. As a matter of fact, they're mm -hmm. like, I think from five, three, five, four, up to as high as about five, nine. That's about where they are. Optimus is at, at five foot eight. And I think figure is like five foot six, somewhere around there. And if someone said that, that Hyundai announced that this bot is five feet. And I'm like, whoa, five feet. That's pretty short. And remember, five feet is measured to the top of your yeah. head. And yeah, the original it's, Atlas- It's 150, one, 150 centimeters. Yes, that, yes. Mm -hmm. So the original Atlas was 411 and didn't really have a head. I mean, it was like kind of like this. So if you think about it, mm -hmm. you know, your, your practical height is the height of where your shoulder is. The head's not that important, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, and the head that they have on there seems to be a pretty big head. So in other words, they're really stretching it. So that means their shoulder might be lower than the original one. And you see yeah. people either think it's taller or mm -hmm. light, you know, it's, it's not in the middle, but there's yeah. a big spread. Yeah, yeah. I mean, everyone's not quite sure. And unfortunately, I, I wanted to put more on there to get a better idea. And I almost think <laughs> five, five, foot five means people at five feet, five or maybe taller than that. I mm -hmm. probably should have better graded there less than or, or mm -hmm. less than. So, so a lot of people had the impression it's short and it may be that it really is around five feet, which would be kind of surprising. And right now I'm, I'm trying to get an idea of what the weight is. And whether mm -hmm. people think it's a little bit heavier uh, than the other bots are right around the same area. So the the Tesla bot is um, it's or it's about fifty seven kilograms, something like that. Mm -hmm. So and then the um, Aptronic, which is a heavier one, is up around seventy two. So I mean, I'm uh, I won't I won't put my guess out there because I, I don't want to <laughs> have the poll. There's still twenty two hours left on, on that one, but yeah. You know, you get kind of an idea. It's I don't think it's going to be more than the Aptronic. I think it should be less than that. I think it might be a little bit heavier than Optimus. Uh, it's a question of, of how much. And again, I want everyone else's sort of intuition to sort of figure out um, what it would be. Mm -hmm. uh, just to get an idea of the weight. But so what did you observe when you you looked at it at first? What, what, besides the, the creep factor? Besides the creepy getting up, uh, at first I wanted to get a priest uh, or something to yeah. to the scene here. But no, I think it's interesting because like you've mentioned, the, the turning points were interesting to see that it moved pretty fast. That was noticeable. I kind of like the design that it can turn around in, in different motions. I think it makes sense, You, you but 
still, of course, with human interactions in a nursing home. I don't know if that's so fun right, to look at. Right, but this at, isn't, this, this but, isn't designed yeah. for the, the yeah, nursing home. Of course, it's, of it's, course. It's, 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 it's so it, yeah, it will for, change. So, so for human, yeah. I mean, for human interaction, I would say mm, maybe, mm, I don't know, maybe a little bit softer, maybe a little bit different uh, from the styling. Right, right. Uh, or also the movement. But I think practicality here is good. But what I really noticed was, uh, focusing on the negatives a little bit, the janky movement when it walked away, that was yes. something I, I immediately yes. you, noticed. You, you noticed that the, the hands, design. Yeah. the arms moved sway yeah. together. They, they should yeah. be now, going it, differently. Now it's, and, and it's kind of like, uh, that, yeah, it's yeah, janking that, a little bit around. I was kind of surprised to see that given everything else it was able to do, that it wouldn't be mm -hmm. uh, a bit smoother. Uh, that I think they, they could definitely improve on that. Now, they talk about this being used in Hyundai. So it's pretty clear from the the other press releases there that the, the target right now is to start using it mm -hmm. in the manufacturing for Hyundai. And if we look at that, as far as, again, going at heights, is that I was I looked at what the um, the average heights are for Americans, for male and female, what, what the 50th percentile is that. For the American female, it's like around 5'4", I think something like that. And mm -hmm. for the American male, it's like a little over 5'6", somewhere around there. So that would be kind of where you'd want to target that if you're going to have something, go for the 50th percentile, because that means ergonomically all your workstations have been designed around that height. Um, yeah. But then in Korea, you're going to have a different demographic. It's going to be a little, little bit different, but it actually is not that much. So I think um, mm -hmm. the 50th percentile Korean woman is only like about an inch shorter than the average American woman. And mm -hmm. when you're trying to design these things, you want to make sure that they work between the 5%, 5th percentile, which means the people below that and, and average height up to the 95th percentile. And then you try to do an overlap between the male and the female. So you say 5% female, 95% male, we need to have, we need to cover somewhere in there. And to do that, sometimes these, these workstations actually have to have little lifts and stuff like that to sort of make the adjustments for that, because there's not really a one size fits all. Mm -hmm. But if you're coming up with a bot, you might say, well, wait a minute, let's kind of pick one that's in there. And but you, you'd want them to be able to go in and replace what's already there and not say, oh, in the future, we're just going to design around the fact that the worker is only going to be five foot tall. So you, mm -hmm. so I'm kind of surprised that it would be kind of at the lower end. But, I mean, the reason to do that is that the smaller it is, the lighter it is, the, the more operation you get out of it. You know, it's not as, as heavy material cost. So there could be all sorts of reasons to want to be in the low end of that spectrum as opposed to the, the high end. So it's not going to be less than five feet, that's for sure. But I, I would thought it would be like a little bit uh, above that level. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is I look at is when it was down there, uh, you can see the hands. I mean, it doesn't really have hands. It, from the elbow mm -hmm. down, it's not a very good design. I don't like the wrist. I don't like the hands. The hands are industrial grippers. They've talked about that they will be swappable, but we've seen those already. And about two months ago, there was a, a video um, that Boston Dynamics showed of Atlas actually doing mm -hmm. useful work for the first time in their laboratory, oh, yeah. but doing something that looked like an automotive type of application. This is called um, Atlas Struts, <laughs> not Atlas Shrugs, but Atlas Struts, and oh, yeah. doing these operations in which we could see hands for the first time. I mean, that was a big thing. It's like, oh my goodness, it has mm -hmm. hands, but they're only three fingers. And the other thing about them is, is the fingers are um, double jointed, <laughs> which means mm -hmm. they can take the finger and not only close the fingers this way, but the other way, something you yeah. and I can't do. And that means they I can, can kind of, one time. I can do it one time. Yeah, yeah, one time. To the it's, <laughs> it's broken exactly. So, <laughs> so they have that, and it seems like they're using sort of the same hand design for it because um, you know. And I'm assuming they're going to come up with something different because that's th those hands are only suited for an industrial application. They're not yeah for like a home or not other kind of commercial application. Not, You're not for holding an egg. <laughs> no, it's not going to be. You know, your waiter is not going to have hands like that. You know, or anything yep. like that. No, it just. You, you, you want to have something a little bit different. So again, they're focusing on probably satisfying the needs of their owner, which is Hyundai and, and proceeding there. Um, but I, you know, there is an advantage to this being a cold take. So I've spoken already on at least five other channels about <laughs> this and gone to like excruciating detail on how <laughs> I like the shoulder offsets and the nice thing that they did down at the pelvis, the, the way they've designed that, the way they angled everything which kind of mm -hmm. makes it easier for it to have that 360 degrees of, of rotation, all that. Um, but you have the huge advantage of a cold take because a little bit of news was generated <laughs> um, mm -hmm. yesterday yeah. regarding this particular design. 
Exactly, and yeah. we, we can kind of talk about that is that uh, one of the things that if we go back to looking at, um, oh, at, at it, there's, there's a close up and that is how they solve the waste. So when we go up, everyone's looking at the legs and the pelvis, but mm -hmm. I noticed it's like, oh, it's, 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 I've seen that waist design before. And I made my typical kind of pun about, you know, never letting um, a good design go to waste or they didn't waste mm -hmm. any time about that. And I didn't realize that uh, Brett Adcock would actually pick up on that pun because what I was pretty much showing is that uh, when Figure came out with their bot, I was like, yeah. I was really impressed with the, their decision on how to do the torso solution. Like, ah, oh, that's that's yeah. a brilliant solution. I really like it. And I see that Boston Dynamics basically has the same design. So yes, they mm -hmm. didn't waste any time on this design. Uh, for those of you who may or may not be native German, uh, English speakers, there's two spellings for waste. One means like the area down your torso, and the other one is like yeah. waste, like mul, you know, something you would toss away. Yeah. So that's my trying to be clever with a pun. And Brett um, <laughs> said, this won't be the last time we're copied, because that obvious figure is doing the best mechanical design in the world. And then later on, he says, they patented that design. Mm -hmm. So that means, yes, the gloves are off uh, when it comes out down there. So... Yeah, he, Why? He, he, yes. So what are the advantages to this particular patent design? And I think if we kind of look at the intro of the video mm -hmm. of, of it, and if we, if we actually look at the wrist, <laughs> okay, <laughs> so we're going to be, yeah, if you kind of stop there a little bit of the wrist or get a little bit of a close up of the wrist, you'll see they're solving a problem of trying to rotate in three different dimensions mm -hmm. by stacking a bunch of actuators on top of one another. And the result of stacking those actuators is you, you take up a lot of space. You get one mm -hmm. under another, under another that, that's up there. And you, you'd like to be able to condense again closer together. And you will see that this is very common in the other bots that have decided they need three degrees of freedom at the waist. The, the Tesla bot solves it another way, and it only has two degrees of freedom at the waist. Um, I think agility doesn't even have anything there. And some of the others have done it by stacking these things. And when you stack it, it eats up into your torso mm -hmm. volume. So a lot of that kind of goes up there. And what happens if the volume of your torso is reduced? Mm -hmm. What can you not put in there? Yeah. Batteries. Yeah, batteries, of course. Yeah, yeah sorry. Yeah, was... <laughs> yeah. So, so if, if, if that, if that uh, chest cavity gets smaller and smaller, you can't put as many batteries in there. And you'll see a lot of the other bots that are they're out there coming from China, they have, you know, a lot of flexibility in the torso is big, long spine, and they have like a volume up at the top, but nothing down at the bottom, which is why mm -hmm. their battery life is not very good because they can't stuff a whole lot of batteries in there. So what they've decided to do is like to maximize the volume of that chest cavity so they can put as many batteries in there as possible. The other thing they've done that is a little bit different than others that we can see from the head is the head seems to have a certain amount of volume. I mean, there's no reason to really make it that big unless you feel like stuffing mm -hmm. some stuff in there. So they've probably stuffed a lot of the electronic components that are typically down in the chest because I know Tesla has their FSD board and some of their other controllers down there and everyone else sort of does the same thing. They probably decided, let's move all that stuff up to the top. Um, other bots, you'll look at it and say, well, they have a head. Aren't they doing the same thing? And you'll see they're actually hollow. I mean, literally some of them are showing there's nothing there except mm -hmm. the cameras. So yeah, yeah. They've, they've got a bit more. We can see they have a communication link there with what looks like a Wi-Fi antenna. I think in the close-up, we might be able to see where some of the cameras are that they're using. Mm -hmm. I don't think they're necessarily using LiDAR, but I um, I think the original Atlas did. So there may be a reason that they have a lot of electronics in there. And then when the head turns, we can see the venting. The vent mm -hmm. tells you yep. there's heat being generated and air is going to get moved around. <laughs> So when you look right there, yeah. so it tells me there, there's a lot of stuff up there, and um, which means they've able to preserve that. But to, to get the big body cavity they want to have down there, you need to have that waist design. Mm -hmm. That's yep. my feeling is the reason for being able to do that. And Figure already came up with that. So when Figure came out with that, I was like, oh, clever solution to get that additional degree of freedom that the Tesla bot doesn't have. Now, what the Tesla bot does not have is the ability to lean forward. And I'm going to kind of show it right here. I mean, if, if you want, we can just yep. pause for a second so everyone can sort of yep. see it. Is that There's two ways to lean forward. You you can actually have your torso oh, literally lean forward, right? Sorry, sorry. So, so you can do, oh, yeah, get me around here. So you can, you can have your torso lean forward like that. Now, mm -hmm. some of us can actually do it, but 
as we get up in middle age, we have difficulty doing that. And the way we actually lean forward is like basically through our legs. So mm -hmm. imagine our legs are straight. This is how we prefer to lean forward. That's how the Tesla bot leans forward. Is it, mm -hmm. it, it rotates about its joints it has down there. And it has the ability in its torso to do this that mm -hmm. way and to lean backwards, you know, this way. But it cannot lean forward. Mm -hmm. When it leans forward, it's got to put its whole body in there. So mm -hmm. what Figure and others have decided to do is they want that degree of freedom. But that degree mm -hmm. of freedom comes with a cost. You could add another actuator in there. And if you're stacking them up there, it takes away a lot of space. There's all these other things. So they've designed what uh, is a parallel kinematic. So rather than serially or making a chain out of them, you have these two things back and forth. And the other thing they've done is that they've been able to take those actuators and actually, rather than stacking them on top of each other, they kind of move them to the side. And you can see it right there. It's really nice uh, that you can see where the actuators. So if we can kind of pause it for a second, you can see that they have those two actuators there onto the side, which are, are those cylindrical motors. And then there's a connecting rod between them. And the connecting rod basically rotates on the top part with that actuator, causing it to move up and down. Now, because you, you are moving not in a plane, but in full 3D, those connecting rods use a type of connection called a, a Heim joint, or some people would call it like a spherical um, uh, yeah, yeah. connector. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so that's important. Like a ball. But, but, um, yes. So it's like, it's almost like a ball and socket in there, but um, it's used to be able to make that connection. And then it goes down to the bottom and in the center part there, it's a little bit hard to see, but it's what most people would be familiar with knowing it as a universal joint. It's known as a carden joint. And um, the patent on that carden joint ran out, I think a couple of centuries ago <laughs> because it was invented in the 1600s by an Italian by the last name of uh, Cardana. Something like that. So that's why it's called a carden joint. And it's used like everywhere in differentials and stuff like that in automotive when you have these different shafts around there. So it's basically like a little crossing cross like this that has uh, rotational elements that are mm -hmm. orthogonal to each other. And what those push pull rods do is that if you push them up and down simultaneously, you make the bot lean forwards and backwards. If you do them differently, it's going to lean left and right. Now, the thing about it is you have a principal direction at those, I mean, the, the ball joint that you see there, you can't go that far out of plane. You can go a little bit out, yeah. but not a whole lot. And the whole idea is just to make up for that slop that's going to go in there. So it means its favorite direction is leaning forwards. So you can get a lot of lean forwards, but lean left and right, not so much, but that's okay because we don't lean like 90 degrees. <laughs> we just lean a little bit. Yeah. And part of that is to help with balance and everything else. So it's very good. It's also very stiff. So you, you, you can actually, you know, keep the torso uh, fixed in the location if you want mm -hmm. to, and you can move very rapidly. So if you need to lean forward really quickly, you can have both motors working for you rather than one that's doing it. So, I mean, there's all sorts of advantages. Now, we've talked about this kind of mechanism before because it's exactly yep. the same mechanism as the, as the Tesla bot wrist and the Tesla mm -hmm. bot ankle, and it's in all these other yep. things. So the big question is, like, if this thing is patented, um, how do they get a patent on what appears to be a common mechanism? Yeah. So again, if you look at the Tesla bot wrist, it's doing the same trick right out yeah, on its wrist. There, is, a, rods, there yeah. is effectively yeah. a carden joint there. And then you have the, the two actuators there, which are um, linear actuators as opposed to rotary. But um, you can do it either way. You can do it with a rotary or not. And the original Tesla bot design, I mean, if you go back to the very first one before they even built anything, you looked in there, they kind of were indicating they were going to do it. Actually, the, the first, um, the very first one, Bumblebee, the movement of its wrist was done kind of that way with a rotary actuator making um, a connecting rod move <laughs> that would then cause the other rotation. So it, it's not like you, you could come up with any choice. Now, how Boston Dynamics is doing it, it's hard to tell. It's a little bit hidden. I'm assuming it's rotary because they don't have any linear drives anywhere else. And I have a feeling they focus just on building linear drives and they may be using the same linear drive that's used somewhere else, like in the wrist or something else down in there to be able to do that kind of movement. So mm -hmm. the question is that, okay, if they get a patent on it, what is the patent? Now I'm not a patent lawyer. Okay. I'm definitely not an expert in patents, but my understanding that with many patents, sometimes you can take what might be an existing piece of technology. And if you've got a novel application for it, it could be patented for that. So the question is, how they've written that patent in such a way to say that this particular mechanism that we have is being used in a very novel way yep. and we want to claim, you know, ex exclusive rights to it or, or have some sort of patent. 
The other thing is I don't know if it's patent pending or if it's mm -hmm. patent granted. Those are two very different kinds of things. Absolutely. And and the other thing is that, like I say, because this is kind of a very common mechanism you'll see somewhere else, it's going to be a big question of, well, is it really patentable? And, you know, if they went for the patent there, did they go for the patent on the wrist as well? <laughs> and the, mm -hmm. and the legs? Yeah. The interesting the thing to notice is that the, the, the figure bot does not use that design in the ankles nor in the wrist. And I haven't quite understood why they 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 aren't doing that in, in the wrist and, and whether they're going to do that in the future. Um, and I was expecting it definitely the legs because a lot of the other robot vendors aren't using that kind of mechanism on the wrist. Some of them have decided to use kind of the, the, the serial kind of um, uh, actuator uh, approach. And that's why it was like, wow, it's interesting they're doing it there in the torso, but they're not doing it down there in the feet <laughs> and the ankles as well. Mm, yeah. So, um, yeah, so there, there's definitely some news there as far as uh, it looks like, you know, figure wants to defend their intellectual property when it comes to that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it's so crazy that uh, we see the, this uh, unfolded and besides the patent uh, dispute they have, um, that the approaches are so different because when you look at the Tesla bot, I mean, it's a similar design, like you said, with the hips, the hip, hip movement. And my question is, why are they focusing so much on, on, on the hip? I mean, for leaning forward, I get it. But um, the wrist actually, for me at least, is very important for, or, or in my opinion, for, uh, for oh, yeah. doing de delicate tasks like this, a very precise tasks as well. And the fidelity of the hands kind of uh, need to be very high. But the Tesla bot also focuses on um, manufacturability, that they don't have too much uh, stuff in there that um, keeps them from producing many of those. And um, they leave out the parts. So my question really was also, when I also looked at this video, um, why is it this movable? Um, I would love to see the Tesla bot falling and try to get up, how that will be mm -hmm. handled from the Tesla bot, if that's even possible. Because this is, of course, a huge disadvantage for the Tesla bot. If it falls, it cannot get up. But I think Boston Dynamics went with this design because like we've seen in the in the test videos or in the retirement videos, that um, they had always, because it has to do parkour, it was important, the movability was very important, that mm -hmm. it can get up and stuff. And when this thing falls, It fell, it, it couldn't get up by itself. I can yeah, imagine so, that. Yeah, some of those, I mean, parkour, a, a lot of those falls that the, the bot really got damaged. And it, it turns out a lot of these bots are not good at falling repeatedly. They they are they mm -hmm. will get damaged. And so you need to have some sort of uh, uh, suspension in many cases when they're doing it to make sure. And then it's it's only when they decide to, um, to shoot a scene that they mm -hmm. will take yep. the suspension cables off to make sure. So- yep. Uh, but at, at some point you got to run it without it and then, you know, take your lumps. And so, yeah, these things were being repaired constantly. They were falling down mm -hmm. a lot because, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to learn anything if they don't fall. And, yeah. and certainly that is a very challenging environment to, to go through. Yeah. Uh, the new Atlas might be a little bit better at being able to fall down. We'll have to see, you know, certainly be able to get up. Now other yeah. bots have done that. I'm, I'm thinking it was like agility showed also that their bot mm -hmm. can go be down the floor and be able to get up. And they worked on with some reinforcement learning, some pretty clever ways of being able to get over. So there were some that depending upon the position they were down, they actually figured out how to roll themselves mm -hmm. over, how to use like one hand and go over. And it was like rather amazing to see what it came up with. But then again, that's the whole idea of reinforcement learning. You go through and you train it and train it, and train it in the simulation, and then it shows away. So that's probably one way the Boston Dynamics bot can get up. I'm sure there's others. They, they yeah. intentionally picked the one that was going to have kind of the first of course, shock value. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm pretty sure that, you know, we haven't seen the Tesla bot be able to get up from the floor, but mm -hmm. I think it should be, have the capability. I don't, I don't see any reason why not. Uh, you know, it might be the kind of thing if you if it's laying flat on its back, it has a hard time. You know, just mm -hmm. like turtles, you know, if they're on mm -hmm. their back, they can't yeah. do anything. Um, but, you know, with your hand or something like that or your arm, you could probably do something to roll over. And then when they're down, do what we would normally do is like, you know, mm -hmm. bend your knees and get into a push-up position and then be able to do that. So. I'm pretty sure they would be able to do that. 
the point I wanted to make. That's why I think they focused also on this movability because they had the problem of falling bots all the time and they were like, oh, we need to fix this. But mm -hmm. for me, is that really necessary? That's my question. Is it, is it important for the use case they are doing? I mean, the movability of the hip movement to turn, to turn the legs, that's the reason. I, I, I can see that. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a good one. Um, but... Yeah, I'm, I'm not. I I'm think not sure. yeah, I think that was was partly the, the the shock value of being able to to mm -hmm. come up from a, a very different way. But if you kind of look at that posture, if you looked at that not being oh I'm facing up but I'm facing down, we can all mm -hmm. kind of do something like that. Uh, at least we used to when we were younger and more nimble. <laughs> but you, yeah. you could have taken an approach sort of like that to get up. It's not the most natural way of of wanting to to get yourself up but i mean think about it it's like if you get your knees forward you can kind of go down like that uh yeah if you practice yoga enough you can almost mm -hmm. do it except you can't do it lying on your back <laughs> if you were yeah. lying on your front you could kind of do it and i guess maybe one of the advantages is, is you're over your um your balance point there but again the way we would do it as humans is we use all our limbs to get up but we're not trying to yeah. bring the legs around to do all the work The main thing is that you kind of push yourself up on your knees. So now you're on that yeah. and then you lift one leg up and then you go up. So it's not like you need a really fast way to get up off the ground. What you need is a fast yeah. way to be able to turn. So when yeah. you pick up a box, you want mm -hmm. to turn around. Yes. you. So that's when it makes sense. Turning is... a probably a huge factor for a factory to, to mm -hmm. move a box from left to right. I mean, it could... We've seen that it could hold a box, for example, just turn around and then turn the legs and then walk, walk and start Does, to walk. It doesn't so even have to do that. It, it, it gets even better that, than that. Okay. I okay, mean, okay. It, see, see, normally what happens is we're seeing the other ones is like they're picking up a yeah. box and then they're mm -hmm. kind of trying to back out from the workspace a little bit and they stutter step back. Boop, 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 and mm -hmm. then they, you know, stutter step to kind of bring them around to get themselves in the right direction. And that's taken like 10 seconds or more. I mean, you're, you're watching these videos and like these bots oh, yeah. are just so slow at being able to turn. Now, in this case, you know, think about what a human has to do. We will pick up the box and we'll take a step or two back away and then we'll pivot. And we can pivot pretty quick and we'll start working, walking forward. Mm -hmm. What this thing is doing is it's not walking away while it's holding the box. It's taking one mm -hmm. leg and turning it around the other yeah. direction, getting mm -hmm. that first step, taking the other one. So in other words, it's reverse direction is already in the direction you want to go to already yep. at forward velocity. And then if it's holding the box... It can it then can spin turn. its torso yep. and bring the box around as you are walking towards ah, it. So uh, yeah. you no, see this, the time saving there is that that the, yeah, whole, the pivoting is done as you're moving there. There is no time wasted in the pivoting. So that's why it will be very, very fast. And it so, looks already in the direction with the sensors and stuff. Like yes, that. it's already looking that way. So that's something we can't do as a human because we don't have eyes in the back of our head. So, mm -hmm. you know, now that um, it's able to turn the head and everything, it's already seeing in that direction, the legs are already in the direction, even if the torso, the upper torso is not there, and even if, if the mm -hmm. payload is not facing the right way. But the payload doesn't have to be facing the right direction until you get to the destination. So mm -hmm. this is like, okay, I'll kind of pick it up, I'll keep on going, and I'll just spin it. And you, you might be spinning it out in an area where you have full volume or, or space to be able to make the move, because a mm -hmm. lot of times, wherever you're pulling it from, you don't have enough room to be able to turn around anyways. So that will save a lot of time in the factory if you're looking at pick mm -hmm. and place. There's, there's no doubt about that. What I also found interesting, um, that was a video we did, the first one when the Gen 2, I think, was announced. We've looked at also Boston Dynamics bots, um, the one that uh, picks up just boxes. And it kind of moves there into, into an area which is new to it and it scans the room. And then afterwards, mm -hmm. it's in 3D already. It is already scanned. So it doesn't need to look at it again. But it can, it can if, yes. if if needed. But then it could pick up uh, the boxes, and I think this is also interesting here because it can just turn the head around. It knows that the three D space behind it is how it is. Uh, like one box is picked up, and then it looks into the other direction, scans the other side again, walks over there, places it, turns around again, yes. scans again the other other side, and yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's yeah. super interesting. Yeah, yeah, it is, and uh, you know one other. Kind of interesting event is, is we've seen that they they can mirror the legs for sure. I think they can mirror the arms. Now the the elbow is not double jointed. It could be double jointed with that design, mm -hmm. but they have hard yep. stops on there to prevent that. And the knees you yep. can't just because the way they're actuated, they are actually actuated with a linkage mechanism. Um, but it looks to me that up in their shoulder area, they they can rotate all the way around probably 
plus or minus 180. So in mm -hmm. theory, they can make the elbows face in the other direction if they want to with the torso. And this is this is what I'm kind of imagining this situation. Imagine you have work in front of you, Jan, and you've got something right behind you. Now, normally mm -hmm. you're sitting in a chair that allows you to spin your body around to be able to do that, right? Yeah. Now, imagine you're working on something in front and now you want to get something behind you. Rather mm -hmm. than spinning, imagine your arms are just able to come behind you. Yeah. And, and, but I, we can't quite do it because we can't spin our elbows around, but, but pretty much mm -hmm. you could like, whatever you're doing in front of you, you can quickly get around behind you, yeah. Yeah. spin your head around so you can see what's going on, but yeah. leave your torso and everything else facing in the mm -hmm. same direction, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. do whatever it is, and then whoop, <laughs> quickly come back on over. So that's something they would be able to do with that kind of flexibility that we really can't. I mean, we can do a little bit behind us, but not as much as we can do in front. And so they, they've got that potential symmetry in there. And mm -hmm. the other thing that, True. A lot of people did not notice is that whole trick when they moved around the entire body turned except for the hip. So if you were to place a yeah. sticker on the hip, you will notice it's always yeah. facing your eye the whole time. Everything else is changing. The torso yeah. is changing. The head is changing. The arms have spun all the way around, but that hip is always pointed in the same direction. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. That, that's a great observation there as well. Yeah. Crazy. <laughs> It makes sense. I mean, the turning for a factory is perfect. The the use cases you've mentioned are good. It's mm -hmm. pretty fast. But my concern would be a little bit, I don't want to say Boston Dynamics did a bad job here. Far from it, of course. But I mean, how do you train this thing? If you teleoperate this thing, you need someone mm -hmm. <laughs> with broken arms. <laughs> uh, so uh, broken legs, broken the hips. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> exactly. And um talking about teleoperation here for example it has similar movements maybe for a person that's a little bit older maybe but uh it has similar movements like we humans do and it can be yeah a te tele that, that would, could be that's the reason yeah i mean they, they do have some weird motions so potentially on the wrist and that's one of the things i, yeah, I don't yeah. like about the wrist design is mm -hmm. that the the one that makes your your hand kind of go left and right, um, yeah, you know, not not up and down. But this particular one, which is known as yeah, the yaw, is being done by an actuator way up here. So in other words, it's like your arm is breaking <laughs> in half when you want the hand to go the other way. So that's going to be like really weird for teleoperation already, which is why they need to change that. However, the elbow is not double jointed and the knee is also not double jointed. So for normal type of things, you're not trying to teach it to go into a configuration you really can't do with a human. A lot of times it's kind of facing around. So they might be able mm -hmm. to do some mapping with that. And then mm -hmm. with their own reinforcement learning, have it learn these tricks of like how to get up from the ground by doing something that's unnatural. But still you can uh, put yeah. it into a lot of natural positions. And then maybe when you say, mm -hmm. oh, but now we want you to turn 180 degrees. Well, you don't teach that. It's like, just teach mm -hmm. me how to pick up the box. Teach yeah. me how to drop off the box. And I might say, mm -hmm. But the walking from here to there, I've got my own kind of approaches to it. But that was like one of the, the first things everyone sort of noted mm -hmm. is that, what, you know, for teleoperation, you want this to have a much better mapping. I mean, that, that's that been the signal we've been hearing from a lot of the mm -hmm. other CEOs you've been talking to. And it's like, why five fingers and stuff like that? Because the human hand has five fingers because the teleoperation is mm -hmm. that way. We don't have, um, you know, six arms or something like that because yeah. we yeah. just don't know how we'd be able to teleoperate that. It needs to be pretty easy. So you do want to be the mapping as close as possible. They, they did say with the head, obviously by having the head spin around gives them other things, but the main reason they decided to put a head on there and allow it to at least rotate back and forth mm -hmm. is for socialization, yep. is to mm -hmm. give you an idea of which way is looking forward and to get an idea of where it's looking at. Now, they didn't go mm -hmm. all the way and allow the head to nod yeah. and go side to side. It looks like it can only do this. You know, it, un yeah, unless they've got a hidden joint in there I can't see, I don't think they can do, you know, mm -hmm. nodding or anything else. Some of the other bot manufacturers intentionally put in what most people would say are degrees of freedom you don't need. Mm -hmm. um, and they said, no, we put it in there because it's All very important for the yeah. socialization. So, so, you know, One X, Apollo, mm -hmm. I think even Phoenix, they all want the three degree freedom head. Tesla just has the two degree freedom head. Um, you know, it can, can do the nod and it can go around. It does look a bit more natural, but, you know, it can't do this. But again, a lot of people argue that's maybe not that important. In, in some cultures, that kind of nod is sort of a little important, mm -hmm. but you know, others not necessarily. And again, I joke, you know, the only time you really need it is when you're playing soccer and trying to do a header. Um, mm -hmm. Otherwise this is good enough and that's kind of good enough. 
And that mm-hmm. seems to be the reason that Tesla moved in, in that direction was for socialization. And Boston Dynamics said, it, you know, definitely that was the reason. Robert Plater said it yesterday or the day before in that interview. That, and, and the other thing is they wanted to come up with just the conundrum that they all have. We want to have a head that's not scary, but at the same mm-hmm. time is an uncanny valley by looking, you know, attempting mm-hmm. to look human when it's not. Yeah. And I think it's like 50-50. It's like you either love it or you don't hate it. I, I yeah. haven't really heard any people that strongly say, oh, I absolutely hate the thing. It's just like, eh, you know, or others say, oh, that's a good choice. That's not bad <laughs> because, mm-hmm. you know, it's it's really hard to satisfy everyone, but I haven't heard anyone strongly condemn the design. However, we've all had fun with it. There's no doubt about it. And me especially, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's the, it reminds me of the ring doorbell and, you know, other people, mm-hmm. it reminds them of, uh, of a portal or like a bathroom mirror, you know, all these things. And you come from a marketing background yep. and you know that... It, it doesn't matter what they say, so long as they say it. Mm-hmm. So if people are saying yeah. Boston Dynamics, Boston Dynamics, New Atlas, New Atlas, New Atlas, it doesn't matter what they're making fun of it. The fact is, it's like getting in the zeitgeist right now, and people are yeah. kind of aware of it. And it's like, so what if you don't like the face? That, that's not the point. I, I pulled up something that, that's from the game Portal. And uh-huh. um, I think, yeah, it ca- kind of reminded me from the aesthetic of the head. I know it looks different here, uh, mm. the head placement here, especially from the ball bot that has a ball in the middle. It, it kind of reminded me from the aesthetic. It could be from Portal, I think, uh, especially yeah. with the glowing ring in the back here. You, you can make something like this also have an appeal and it doesn't has, have to look human to be cute or fun to look at. I think it makes sense because uh, those are also lights. This makes sense because then it can sh- it doesn't need a flashlight here it has right. a ring light in in the face and you also get status i, I believe they can do different mm-hmm. colors so it's it's mm-hmm. not just yellow but uh yeah, yeah they, they, they can put different status messages there mm-hmm. to kind of let you know mm-hmm. yeah it does seem like they put the cameras hidden behind there so they don't look like yeah. eyes um, yeah, yeah they've all worked really hard uh aptronic they put a lot of design effort in trying to come up with a head that would be reasonable um, mm-hmm. agility also struggled with the idea they first had something that looked too much like um, a, a creepy bot, you know, like the, the, the bot from uh, the day the earth stood still. <laughs> and mm-hmm. they, they changed it a little bit because some people didn't like it. And it was like a really quick design that turns out to be very good. And that even if it uh, doesn't look human, like it does have kind of that warm thing. I, mm-hmm. I actually liked mm-hmm. it. You know, it's a yeah. very, very, yeah. very simple thing. It's not off putting or anything like that, but at the same time, mm-hmm. it's not trying to be too human. It's, it's almost like a big pupil, like yeah. a floating pupil that, you know, it looks at you and Mm -hmm. it's almost like, okay, look, what's a little bit creepy is that you look kind of into a void. (laughs) I think still it it has an appeal. But then some people are saying it's like the the Pixar lamp, you know, that, that Mm -hmm. that old one, but that some people may may not remember it's, and they, and in Boston dynamics did say that was like one of the inspirations for it. Mm -hmm. You know, it'll be okay. And if it's in the factory, who cares, you know, in the the home, maybe not, but that's not going to be the bot for the home. Uh, It's, it's, there's a lot of things that have to be cleaned up for it to really be safe enough to work in the home environment. Though they've come a long ways. I mean, you think about it when you look at Atlas and, and all the, the cabling and everything that was kind of sticking out. In yeah. this case, it's like, man, where's all the cables? They did a really good job of securing all of it. You can't mm-hmm. see it anywhere. And mm-hmm. all everyone's first generation bots had like all sorts of cables all over the place. And so it's a reasonably clean design for their yeah. first generation electric bot, you know. So this is sort of the second generation Atlas, but it's the first generation of they're all electric. Mm-hmm. And um, you know they're going to learn a lot from this, and they're going to clean up the design and have probably something different in in a year from now, as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's it's, it's very impressive. Uh, so what is your impression when you compare all the bots i mean you have so many mm-hmm. so many bots inside inside of your head uh, apollo for example is also one and you've mentioned some uh, on the side yes. how do you yeah. think mm-hmm. uh, to to arrange those i mean the tasks are different of course uh, some are for human interaction mm-hmm. more some are for factories i mean maybe we just stick with the factory bots here but uh, how do you see that how is is it is the Tesla bot better? Is it worse? Uh, how would you would you compare it with the Tesla bot? Yeah, we, we don't know enough about the specs on, on yeah, of course. this for sure. Um, we're guessing a little bit. Now, do you think this is stronger than the first Atlas or weaker than the first one? Of course, weaker in some sense. It ha- doesn't have this explosiveness. 
mm -hmm. because it's hydraulic and hydraulic really is i mean you can see it i mean this looks yeah. like a brute uh if here uh, the, yeah. this thing uh, how yes. it moves like it, it picks it up pulls it out it's almost like this thing is made for running behind a car and uh, janking out the door and yeah. ripping the passengers out yeah. <laughs> kind of uh, for saving them or whatever <laughs> but uh like it's very violent and aggressive in, in pushing not so delicate but it has a lot of power and explosiveness that's why it can make all those backflips and stuff so i right. assume that needs to have strong motors but i know it from the gimbals of course because i'm from video production the motors that are inside of there they are very delicate and they have a weight limit of course i don't know what weight limit those sizes have but if the weight is more it uses more power so it depends what's your view okay. on that because i'm, well, I'm not yeah in the i mean field. the first impression is that we know hydraulics are just like have a lot of power Of course. Yeah. And that, you know, the assumption is that if you're going all electric, you're going to be sacrificing something there. The thing is, these are not your, your father's electric motors. Everyone is redesigning things. So they probably have way more power than we're used to seeing. They're, yeah. they're going to be a bit more expensive. So it's kind of hard to use our intuition and how strong it is. So I was surprised when they came yeah. out and said that the new Atlas is stronger than the old one. Wow. Now, now the question is how you measure that. Is it like the payload it's able to take? Because in the end of the day, that's what you really care about. I You know, until I can see this thing doing backflips, I don't think it's designed to do parkour like the first yeah. Atlas was. However, yeah. we do know it is possible for an all-electric bot to do a backflip because we already saw it from Unitree. They, they've got their bot being able okay. to do something like that. So it, uh, yeah, it may be right. possible. But again, you don't need to do parkour. The real thing is like how much payload can you pick up and everything else. So this, this is definitely more practical from that standpoint. So um, the thing is... Uh, as I said, you know, from the elbow down, I'm not really that happy with it because it doesn't really mm -hmm. have fully formed hands, but there may be plenty of industrial applications where that's absolutely suited for it. Mm -hmm. um, if you, you know, I would say that it's on par with the others, but, you know, not at the top of the leaderboard. But, yeah, uh, you know, on, on Tuesday night, CERN was taking Boston Dynamics off the, the, his chart and it was never kind of really in there because it was all R&D. It was really never meant mm -hmm. uh, to be used. Uh, because that's what they said so. And the next day he had to go and update it again and put the new Atlas in there. So so now mm -hmm. we know we have another player for sure. Uh, it's, if it's a beautiful design that they have, absolutely beautiful design. And so, again, you see, they have a head, but there's nothing there. The head yeah, is more or less to put the, the, you know, I think they might have some cameras there or just to kind of let you know uh, what's there. But you see, it is possible to do a backflip with an all-electric bot um, with... <laughs> enough testing yeah, it, in the lab it and everything really else. has to throw the arms really around yes. kind of uh, you now, can see that yeah. okay now remember now here's where you can see a, a difference from simulation and reality in the simulation you see the head stay still when he's all done the reality uh, yeah. is mm -hmm. it goes all over the place so that's the difficulty in modeling the other thing you'll notice mm -hmm. when it does that flip and simulation does it perfect and here it under rotates and has to recover now you know all those those videos of them pushing these bots around kicking them and knocking them down. The whole point of that was teaching these things to be able to recover. <laughs> so what happened is that thing, you know, was able to do the flip and then it wasn't able to complete the flip and then it started to lose its balance, but it's already got the muscle memory and how to recover. So they didn't have to teach that part. That's in there. So that's the reason you push these things around. So when you start asking it to do a particular task and if things don't go quite well, it's able to recover. And that's the same thing. I mean, it's like if you go down and, and do any sort of gymnastics yourself, um, you're trying to do it, but you know that when you fail, suddenly instinct kicks in, right? And you're able to do whatever you have to do to either recover or make sure you don't fall as bad as it may seem. Do, do you think really that this thing can be as strong? Because we've seen that Unitry did it with a lot of Again, what, swimming. What does, and, yeah. what does strong mean? You know, if, if it means mm -hmm. it can more reliably pick up like a 40 kilogram payload versus, you know, mm -hmm. maybe True. the other Atlas was able to do 30 or 35. So there's going to be the different metrics you're going to go in there, um, you know, whatever its deadlift is or something like that. So they may have some of those. I, I would not be surprised it has a certain amount of strength. The mm -hmm. um, they're, they're now a contender. It's a very nice design. But then when you compare it to Optimus, you forget that mm -hmm. Optimus is like really a beautiful design. <laughs> After, after I looked at it, it as like, oh yeah, Optimus is still in a, you know, mm -hmm. the shoulder is much cleaner. You just see everything else the way it's covered up. So as much as Boston Dynamics has done a good job on that first iteration mm -hmm. of making sure the wires aren't sticking out, there's still a lot about the, the Optimus bot 
which um, you know you just sort of see is is, mm -hmm. is is kind of better packaged in many ways. And and Optimus is something that you could see going into the household almost as it is. Mm -hmm. There's probably a few changes that would still have to be made to Optimus to go into the household, but um, yeah. it's a lot closer to be able to do that for sure. And you know, again, it's better from the elbow down. Um, and um, they have some advantage, but you know, I, I think if Optimus wanted to, there's there's no reason why he couldn't also do that trick with the legs and rotating around. I, I don't see any any restrictions in there as, as far as the way the, the torso is designed and the legs. So they may, may have just um, uh, some uh, yeah. limits in there. So there, there really is no reason why it couldn't do the same thing if Tesla didn't want to. However, so this means also Elon posted in the, out. In the, yeah. Yeah, in the hip, it, it does it have in the hip also a rotation? Yeah, it has that same rotation. Oh, so yeah. it's, it's okay. basically kind of the same mm -hmm. order. So so it has that for being able to do what's called like mm -hmm. the pronation of the knees um, to, to go uh, in yeah, and out. Go. You, need, you need that rotation to be yeah, able yeah, to walk. Yeah, of course. Yeah, you, you have to. But most like, of it just restricted that motion to like maybe yeah. plus or minus 30 degrees because that's about all you need, not, not much yeah. more than that. However, you actually look at the design uh, physically, mm -hmm. there's no reason why it couldn't do a 180 as well. The only reason mm -hmm. you, you don't want doing that is like it kind of messes up your cabling and <laughs> trying to figure yeah. out how to get it through because it's going to kind of wind up. So a lot of them are just like, well, that we don't need to do that much with a human, so we'll limit it. But mechanically, there's no reason why yeah. they, they couldn't open that up. And, and what I find very interesting here is that I see that a little bit as a disadvantage for stability. It can rotate 360 degrees almost, almost mm -hmm. every joint, more or less makes it very flexible it's almost like a snake uh, in in some parts but what i think is bad it doesn't have the mechanical strength kind of to hold itself the tesla bot has more of a of a structure to it where it's yeah kind of it has still the mechanical limitations if that makes sense so the engines yeah, or the motors yeah, don't when you hit, have when you to, hit a hard stop yeah that that can help you from like going further than you want yeah, like, to so yeah, yeah exactly yeah so to, uh, for uh, the resting positions or yes yeah. so a lot of industrial robots you know they, they do have hard stops to make sure yeah. that you can't move around even and if you just take those stops off again then go beyond yeah. that but then you have the problem of that cabling and everything starts winding up and and that's the reason why you don't want to do it so they could do it it's just a question if they want to i don't think they will because elon posted a tweet um, just a little bit after the Boston Dynamics, his reply to the Boston Dynamics one. And it was some scene from, I think the movie was Ring of, yeah. of this little girl that gets yeah. up and she does the exact same thing with her legs yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. And and so when I looked at that, it's like, uh, Tesla bot's not going to even attempt to do that. You know, he lends against that idea. So uh, even though it could, I don't think we're going to see them do it. But, you know, and you never know. He could be wrong. It could just be Elon yeah. trolling. Yeah, sure. I think it was a success in my opinion. I think it's a good good approach. It can be useful in the factory for depending on tasks they're going to do. But how do you see this uh, bot revolution going on now? I mean, you're in the field for so many decades already. How do you, do you view this advancements we had in the last 10, at, at least 10 years? It's crazy. Yeah. There could have been one or two takeaways from the announcement of the retirement of the first Atlas. Um, one of them could be that there's no market there. Boss Dynamics is moving to somewhere else because they have the spot dog and they also have mm -hmm. the stretch bot, which looks more like an industrial bot. And they may decide, oh, that's where our future is, is, is traditional stuff. The, the space for humanoid bots is like, you know, that, that's crazy. We don't mean that. So if they really retired, did that, that would have been kind of a bearish signal towards this whole idea of humanoid bots. Yeah. But no, the next morning they kind of came out and said, nope, we're here. We're, we're not going anywhere. And so that I see that as a very bullish signal overall um, that they, they did that. And again, remember, is not only were they sort of, you know, the, the pioneers in this area, a lot of people from Boston Dynamics went out and started to set up these other companies or people set up those companies were mentored by some of the people within Boston Dynamics. So they, they all have great respect for the, you know, mm -hmm. the founders of Boston Dynamics and many of the others in there because of what they've learned and, so it's kind of nice to see them back in there. And again, I say it's a really good signal that, yeah, we're here for it. And, you know, it's one more thing to think about is, is they were a partner and still are a partner with NVIDIA. And again, mm -hmm. like the more you have that, the more NVIDIA is going to throw resources at this thing as well. So you, you just get this flywheel effect yeah. of things improving and getting better and better and better. Um, and of course, it's, it's going to create more startups. We're, we're seeing more startups every day of other companies all around the world. Uh, just coming in and deciding, hey, we want to go ahead and do it. 
people literally building them in the garage and, and figuring yeah, out with 3D I've printers and everything how to put print. some together. And and those those will have maybe very niche applications because you know when, when you want to get to the, the volume and, and stability and durability and something like that, it, it takes a little bit more than just a, a garage and a 3D printer. Um, but it doesn't mean you can't get a lot of learnings from it. And then from it, of course, you know, get venture capital and stuff like that to be able to take that idea somewhere else. So we're going to start seeing a lot more out there. I, th I think that's what it says. And that um, it's it's a good, strong signal for the, the future of humanoid bots. Absolutely. Yeah, I totally agree, Scott. I think also that people have to view this from a different lens also, especially in the Tesla community. It's almost like always the competition. If something goes into this bubble, something a foreign kind of <laughs> a foreign entity entering the Tesla bubble, just Tesla, There's the only, that's the only thing we, we see. It's good for the whole industry. It's good that everybody uh, uh, jumps it's, onto this it, to, to advance yeah. this technology. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, it's a huge TAM and it, it's, they're not taking business away from anyone else Yeah, because no, none of them can produce enough to be able to satisfy the demand that's out there. And I've always felt the same way with, with Tesla is that the other EVs are coming out. They weren't competition yeah. to Tesla. They were competition to ICE. Yeah. And the more of them you have out there and more acceptance, that means the more charging stations you're going to have, everything else, all the infrastructure that you need. So rather than Tesla going alone, it's a lot harder when you get the others coming in there First of all, they're helping to satisfy a demand that Tesla can't meet anyways. You know, they can only produce a couple of million a year. And if the demand for EVs is four or five million and Tesla can't fulfill that, well, you want that to get fulfilled because by doing that, you get greater acceptance. And again, that yeah. means people start thinking about, oh, we need to have charging at home. And what are the codes going to yeah. be for that? More public standards in parking garages and everything else. So that gets it going. And that's positive for Tesla no matter what. So again, doing this, I think, is also a very positive signal. And mm -hmm. it, it, you know, not investment advice or anything like that, I'm not trying to predict anything, but what this means is that people on Wall Street who are not including Optimus in, uh, in Tesla share values right now may be thinking twice about it, saying, well, maybe there's a little bit more to this Optimus project than we thought all along. We're not even putting it there. It, they probably aren't going to come out tomorrow and announce it. But what it means is that behind the scenes, they're going to start researching this thing more thoroughly to kind of update their particular theses to figure out what's going on. There have been a couple that have started to move in that direction. And I think you'll see a lot more. And if it means anything, when I start looking at people who start following me on X and then mm -hmm. yeah. looking at, at some of them and their backgrounds, like, oh, this is, this, is, this is rather interesting that people from some of these different financial backgrounds are suddenly wanting to follow my take on these things because it's probably something they're trying to use to inform their own thesis. It makes sense. This this is a big technology adventure that many companies are mm -hmm. on also that they're going to switch around in the in the field. Engineers will go to figure, then they go to Tesla, then I mean they share mm -hmm. their knowledge or patented stuff. Uh, sometimes <laughs> they they take yeah. ideas with them or implement stuff they they already learned and being with a bit uh, loose <laughs> with their implementations a little bit dangerous there. Those things have to be sorted out, but I think for the whole bot industry if you calculate that in, I mean, this is a even bigger upside than the, actually the energy sector. Worldwide GDP, half of it is labor. Yeah, it's exactly. as simple as that. You know, it's like, yeah. wow, that's, that's a pretty big TAM. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So Scott, thank you very much for, for mm -hmm. being on and giving your two cents or even more cents here to, to, to this topic. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody should follow you on X, of course. I think you've got great analysis. And of course, your face will be seen in all the Tesla channels and robotics channels now because you, you give such great insights. So thank you very much, Scott. Yeah, there's only yeah. one last thing to say to the audience. And that's goodbye, everybody. Yeah, cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Wasn't this episode awesome? Let's accelerate the pace of innovation by subscribing to Tesla FX. It is my absolute favorite channel on the whole interwebs.